how can we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, as we're called on to do, when it's someone that we've never seen, uh, he's, he's immortal, he looks down upon us, he, he, all, all, it, we're, we're separated by so vast a thing, uh, a space and time, and, and, and our natures are different. How can we really have a, a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and, just as importantly, with his heavenly Father? And that was the, the problem that we, we started with last time, you'll remember. Now, does anyone remember how many times in the book of Philippians, because what we're doing, for those who weren't here last time, we're taking the book of Philippians and we're taking themes out of the book of Philippians to try and help us unravel this problem, solve this problem. How can we have a relationship? What are the key components that we need to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? And the reason we're taking Philippians is because how many times in Philippians does, does the Apostle Paul mention Jesus Christ or the Lord or, or yeah, that, those sorts of terms of Jesus? How many times? Anyone remember that? So he mentions it in four chapters. He mentions it 55 times. And what we got out of that was that the whole thinking of the Apostle Paul was Christ-centered. <coughs> All right. And so therefore, I think it's a great book to actually try and let's get into how what made uh, the, the Apostle Paul uh, feel he had that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last time we actually identified the as, as Jeremy's indicated, we actually found the first component, vital component in holding a relationship with Jesus Christ and therefore with his father. And we found that in Philippians chapter three. So let's just go back to Philippians chapter three. And you'll notice um, this is what we found where he, he, he says in Philippians 3 and verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things, that I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So he's all Christ-centered here. He wants to, to gain Christ. And you notice what he says in verse 10. This is what he valued, that I may know him, that I might know him. So we actually talked a lot, and that was our class last time, was to, to, to really think about what it meant to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first vital component that we had uh, and identified is that we need to strive to know Jesus Christ. To inspire to know him actually is all about getting to know his character and trying to bring all of that together in facing the day-to-day -day issues of life. Remember, we had that big circle of all the different components of, of, of the Lord's thinking. And the challenge was to try and bring all that together in any decisions and, and our walk in, in, in life. Because not only was he merciful, but he was also holy. Not only was he compassionate, but he was also righteous. And, and so there was this this full picture, if you like, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the challenge that we talked about uh, last time. So we need to strive to know him. In other words, we need to have Christ living in us. Something we can only do by spending time in his presence. So that's sort of where we, we've got to. And tonight, what we want to do is to actually identify another component, a second component uh, that I think is very important in this relationship with our Lord and with his Father. So we're going to pick it up again in Philippians chapter 3, and it actually, it's in the verse that we just, just talked about. Verse 7 and 8, which we just read, Paul says he, his value system, and we talked about this last time, his value system was all about knowing Christ. That's what he valued, and everything else was, was lost to him. And then we pick it up in verse 10. So he says, this is what he valued, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So through faith, he desired to know things, didn't he? He wanted to know him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to know the power of his 
resurrection. That's what we're told there in verse 10, isn't it? So it's not only just what we talked about last time, knowing him, but knowing the power of his resurrection. Now, no, we're not going to talk about that, but it's it's really about living as a baptized, uh, being baptized into Christ and rising with him. And we have Christ, the risen Christ, influencing us. That's the power. And what else the third thing he wants to that he values? He values knowing him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. Now, fellowship simply means, Strong says, a partnership. It's participation. Other versions have it, and they translate it as sharing. So, so he, he valued sharing his sufferings. And so that's our second point that we want to talk about tonight. That is a key component in building our relationship with the Lord, and that is that we need to value sharing his sufferings. And the idea of sharing is, is really important, isn't it, in any relationship that we have. A, a sharing of experience brings a relationship closer, doesn't it? A sharing of experience brings an empathy between people. You know, I was once talking to a sister who had lost a child, a terrible thing. And she said, I wanted to talk to people about it, but found I couldn't because no one would understand. But she said, I found comfort in talking to those who had experienced the same thing. They understood. And isn't that true? A sharing of experience brings a feeling of empathy into a relationship. And Paul says he valued sharing not just knowing about what the Lord went through, but sharing the Lord's suffering. And that's an important component of our relationship, I would suggest, with our Lord and what we're going to talk about tonight. But it wasn't that Paul deliberately went out and out of his way to experience suffering, wasn't it? He didn't get, go out and say, here I am, you know, uh, stone me. You know, here I am, you know, persecute me. It, that, that wasn't. What the, what the apostle did. You know, he says, he doesn't say, oh, here I am, look, I put pressure under, on me. I, 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 I want that. That's not what he did. He, he worked at knowing his Lord and serving to bring people to him and suffering just followed. It's actually something to expect in our relationship with the Lord. It's an essential component. We have this quote here in Acts 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So, pressure, suffering, trouble, that will come. It's needed to enter into the kingdom of God. The timing of it is, is not clear. It might be all good now, but, but it, it will come. It, it is something that will come. We don't know how it might occur with us, but it will come. No. We know it's in the world, don't we? Because of sin. And we are caught in that particular situation. There's mortality, there's sickness, there's, there's accident. And we're affected by that environment, aren't we? We know that. But why does knowing Christ, why does having a relationship with Christ mean suffering is involved at all? It's not because God takes pleasure in it. Or he, he wants to sort of to, to crush us or something. He wants us actually to be in his kingdom, 
not to crush us. And I think the key to answering that question is why does having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ involve suffering is captured here. Matthew 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I think there we have help in this situation. Suffering is involved because we're treading on the same path of the Lord and his path led to crucifixion. Suffering is involved because it requires us to see that my life is not about me, it's about him and his way. Isn't it? We're coming after Christ, we're following Christ, and that involves denying self and taking up his cross and following him, walking in his footsteps, opposing sin and and elevating God's way. And that requires a number of things, doesn't it? It requires hard personal decisions. It requires personal change. It requires shining as lights, crucifying sin. That's what it requires. Things in themselves that will require conflict, pressure, difficulties. Opposition, disappointments, worry. It's not just persecution. It's all of those other things, you know, hard personal decisions. I don't know if you know anyone. These glasses aren't working very well. Um, I don't know if you know anyone that's had to make a personal decision of leaving all the friends that they've known. When they've come to the truth, they've had to, they've had to actually leave them all behind and, and have a whole new set of friends. There's personal, difficult decisions and change that might be required. Of walking away, well, not away, but, but having a different relationship with different people than what they've been used to. You see, look what the Apostle Paul said himself here in verse 8 of Philippians 3. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and to count the but dung that I may win Christ. Paul made a decision to be with Christ. And what did that mean? Well, it meant that he suffered for that decision. He suffered the loss, he says, of all things. Well, what things? Well, it's all the things of verses 5 and 6. It's all the things that were important to man. That's what he lost. He, he, he lost all of that. He was the champion of the Jews uh, with letters to, to, recon to, to recommend him to persecute the, uh, the ecclesia and the believers. But he didn't see that losing all of that as a bad thing at all. But nevertheless, it impacted his life. There was, there was a cost to, to his change. He was no longer the honoured Pharisee. But he was a despised follower of Christ. And it was a result of hard decisions, personal change that he had to make. Now, sometimes when we think of Paul's sufferings, we think of the, the beatings and the imprisonments, don't we? You know, the shipwrecks and, and all the spectacular physical stuff of the sufferings that he, that he went through, the beatings and so on. But there was also more emotional hidden sufferings that he went through. You realise that. Here's what he says here. In uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 28, and I just selected a little bit because I think you know this well. In hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, he lists down all the things he'd suffered. And then he says, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the ecclesias. The care of of all the ecclesia. See, it wasn't just the physical sufferings and hunger and thirst and so on, but he was he was under more pressure than a normal another person because he was concerned and taking care of all the ecclesias. Growing them, visiting them, thinking about them, praying for them, worrying about them, 
There's this emotional strain on the Apostle Paul to carry that out. And just have a look at Philippians chapter 2, actually, because there's an example of this here, where he talks about Epaphroditus, his fellow soldier. Have a look at Philippians 2, verse 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick. So here's Epaphroditus, he's been very sick. And, and verse 27 says, for indeed he was sick near unto death. So he was at death's door. Death was, was so close to Epaphroditus. And then he says, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also. Really? On the Apostle Paul, why? Anyone got any ideas? What was the mercy shown to Paul here? What does it say? Pardon? He got better, but what? Why was why was the mercy shown to Paul as well? So it was mercy shown to Epaphroditus. He got better, but what was the what was the mercy shown to the Apostle Paul? Notice what it says at the end of the verse. It wasn't just on him only. But on me also, Paul says, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. How, how was the mercy on Paul? Because it would, would have added, if, if the Epaphroditus had died at this particular point, it would have added further sorrow to Paul. And he's already in prison here. Paul not only suffered physically, you see, but he also suffered with the sufferings of others. He really felt for them, and it impacted him personally. He, he was care. He took care of the ecclesias, and, and he was personally involved and interested in the brothers and sisters in the ecclesia. It wasn't just some sort of big organizational thing like that. He was personally interested in individuals within the ecclesia as well. And here it was, Epaphroditus, who he, he labels as a, as a fellow soldier in verse 26, who, who ministered to my wants. He was Paul in prison, and, and he was ministering to, to Paul there. And if he'd been taken away, it would have just added sorrow upon sorrow to the Apostle Paul. So he sees God's mercy in that. So in Christ, suffering will come upon us all. But what does it mean to fellowship his suffering? You notice that back in chapter 3. Notice what it says, verse 10, the fellowship, the sharing of his suffering. What sort of suffering was that? The sharing of his sufferings. Right, well, okay, we're going to look at this. We're going to unpack it a little bit because how can that be? He was scourged and he was crucified, as you say, the, the highlights of exactly what you say there, Tim. How, how can we share his sufferings? Well, I'd suggest it's telling us how we need to see our sufferings. Yes, we may be suffering, but the critical thing is how we respond. And that comes down to how we see it. Paul saw all his emotional, mental and physical sufferings as Christ's sufferings, not just his own. And I think of all the things on this subject, this is so critical and so helpful, I think. In other words, it's not saying we suffer exactly the same circumstances as our Lord, although we may experience some of them in some measure. But it's saying we experience similar feelings and emotions and struggles in our circumstances as the Lord suffered. So, so there is to be a sharing of feelings and appreciation in our lives in a small way of what our Lord went through. 
So what were the sufferings of Christ? Well, I think it's helpful to write these down as a list and to, to, to really think about these things. Let's go across to Isaiah chapter 53. While you're going there, I think I've uh, forgotten to put that up there, that last dot point there. You might want to put that on your notes because, as we saw, being in Christ means we've got greater responsibility and a greater sensitivity because we are part of a body. And so like the Apostle Paul, he felt for Epaphroditus, he cared for the Ecclesia, they were individuals, that he, he, he was not just organisational, he was involved and saw them as people, brothers and sisters within the body. So I want to just add that to your note. Now, Isaiah chapter 53, let's now consider what were the sufferings of Christ. Well, the chapter is based, as you probably know, on the experience of Hezekiah, but it's clearly speaking of the experiences of our Lord. And you only have to go down, it's probably a good idea to go down through the margin. If you've got a King James Version, you'll find there's there's a lot of references and citations in the New Testament uh, relating these words to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's clearly related to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, what do we have? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now when you read that verse... What's emphasised? What, what, what's, what's the ideas that's emphasised in that verse? Anyone? It's not about physical abuse, is it? It's about that he was rejected by those he came to save. Notice that despised, it's in there twice. He is despised. The end of the verse, he was despised. The first line of the verse, he is despised and rejected. At the end of the verse, and we esteemed him not. We, and that's the idea of he wasn't valued. These are all the words applying to the Lord. They weren't physical things here. They were more emotional, weren't they? He was... We could summarise like that, despised, rejected, and not valued. That was our Lord, wasn't it? Well, how was all that seen? Well, let's just capture some of those things as we go through it. Just, just think about it. We're not going to turn these up, by the way, but I've listed them in the, the little table that you've got on your notes, just so you can sort of capture the idea. So, so Luke 4 and verse 29, it's really about this, that he was opposed and threatened. It was where he was at Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and he, and he reads and he teaches in the synagogue, and, and they know his parents there. And, and they say, isn't this Joseph's sons? And they're angry at his teaching, and they take him outside the city, and they, you know the story, they thrust him out, and they're going to throw him over the cliff. And he goes on and he, and he walks through them and, uh, and he's saved. But he was opposed and threatened. And that's just one example, isn't it? John 7 and verse 5. His family disbelieved. It says there, neither did his brothers believe in him. They said, if you want to be a public figure, you know, then come out in the open. You can, just, you can just hear brothers saying that sort of thing, couldn't you, really? You know, if you want to be a public figure, mate, they just come out in the open. Well, that's what they were saying to him in John 7. And in Mark 3, in verse 21, the relatives said he was mad. The family comes out to lay a hold on him, and they were repeatedly saying, he is beside himself, the record says. Now, this is through his life, all right? Now, they may have changed as, as, as his, his ministry went forward, but... 
at these various points, this is the type of reception he was receiving. His relatives said, he's beside himself. In John 13 and verse 18, the last supper, he's betrayed by a close friend, isn't he? He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his hand against me. And in Luke 19, 41, he comes to the city of Jerusalem, you know, where he's looking down on the city and he weeps over the city. And why did he weep? Well, he wept because they didn't see the conditions that would give them peace. They rejected him. And he weeps because of their unbelief. The emotional strain on this man. And then in John 6 and verse 66, we find that some of the disciples leave him because he started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And they thought that was a hard saying and so we're told they left him. And the ultimate rejection, of course, is when they cried, let his blood be on us and on our children. Crucify him, take him away. We have no king but Caesar. That was the ultimate rejection, wasn't it? So he was a man despised, rejected and not valued. Well, let's have a look at verse 4, where it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it's fairly obvious as you read that that the second major thing of his sufferings was he, that he felt the weight of our weaknesses. That's what that little section's about, isn't it? Verse 4 to 6. He felt the weight of our weaknesses. Notice the emphasis on, on why he suffered. What's the little word that's highlighted? Have you got it highlighted in your Bible? What's the little word that really jumps out at you as you read verses 4, 5, and, and, and 6 as well, but it's more in 4 and 5? that really emphasises that he felt the weight of our weaknesses. I've got it coloured in because it jumps out at you then. What is it? Our, that's right. Our. Notice that, verse 4, Surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You, you see, and it's in verse 6 as well at the end, us. The iniquity of us all. He was bruised for our iniquities. He carried our weaknesses. See how that jumps out at you? That's why he feels the, weak, the, the weight of our weaknesses. Now, how did that live out? Well, You'll notice verse 4, it's a little citation in the King James Version anyway, it takes you across to Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17. Let's just go across there to see this in action. Matthew 8, verse 17, just so we can understand what that means. Matthew 8, verse 17. You'll see it there. Verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So there it is, he's quoting from Isaiah 53. And he's relating it to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's doing in this particular uh, context. Let's have a look at the context. In verse 14, we pick the story up there. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. So he heals Peter's wife, wife's mother, who, who, sorry, who was sick of a fever. And then verse 16 says, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that was sick. So when the even, notice that, when the even was come, Luke's record says, now when the sun was setting, and Mark 1 verse 33 says, all the city was gathered together at the door. So there's the, there's the picture. So it's at the end of the day. The sun is just sit, setting and, and all the city was gathered together at the door. 
Now, it felt a bit like that tonight at home. For example, we had, we had all the grandchildren over, so there was 15 of them plus their parents, and there was about 20 of them at the door, right? But here's the whole city, it seems. All come out, and they're at the door. So it's a, whether it's the whole city, but it's certainly a lot of people here. And, and, and they come, and what's the type of sicknesses they have? Well, Luke 4 and verse 40 tells us they were sick with disease and there was the mentally disturbed and they were crying out. Mark 1 says in verse 34, they were, they were crying out and yelling out and you had all the people with disease and they're crying out and then there's the, and there's the mentally disturbed crying things out, you know, in the, as they're waiting in the queue to see Jesus at the door. Can you just picture that? I, 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 you see Jesus in the door, and there's this queue of people. They're sniffing and blowing their noses, and, and, and others yelling out, and, 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 and maybe falling on the ground, writhing around. Oh, this, this was the city. There are heaps of people lying at the door. And it says that he, at the end of verse 16, that he heals them with his word or with a word, as other versions have it, with a word. And he healed all that was sick. Luke 4 and verse 40 says that Christ laid his hand upon each one of them and healed them. So he uses a word and then he lays his hands on each one of them. And there's a cure a mile long. You see, there's an, an individual approach to each one of them. That was the Lord's way. He healed all. None was too far gone to be healed. I think that's such a powerful lesson, isn't it? None were too far gone to be healed. And so we have the words of verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This is a little picture here that's seen as a fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and verse 4. And here the word infirmities, by the way, means the feebleness of body and mind. So it's got the idea of our, our weaknesses and diseases he bore. But how did he do that? <coughs> Well, I think the point was that he carried out the miracles at his own expense. It wasn't just power, but there was personal interest here from the Lord. He became involved with the sickness. And the long line that, that, that went from that door was evidence they couldn't heal themselves, wasn't it? There was healing through him alone. You know, he could have healed them in one go, couldn't he? He sort of, you know, be clean or, or you're, you're healed. He, he could have done that, but he didn't. It was one by one. Laying his hand on each one. Saying a word. And there was that contrast of that long line. They couldn't be healed by any other except him. And I think... The lesson is that he felt every individual's disease. He felt every individual need, both physical and spiritual. Here's an example of how he bore the, the full weight of our weaknesses. It was as though for those that were sick, he was sick. For those who were hungered, he suffered hunger. For those who were thirsty, he suffered thirst. That was our Lord, wasn't it? And how did he feel after all of that? Well, he was totally and utterly exhausted. That's how we know it's, it, this, this was personal. He was totally and utterly exhausted. Have a look at verse 20, for example. And Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. And then verse 24, he gets into the boat. Behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. 
And his disciples came to wake him, uh, to, uh, came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. He gave his all for others, brothers and sisters, young people. And now he's totally, absolutely exhausted and not even a storm where the waves are breaking over to the boat could, could wake him up. And you know, not only was he weighed down by the problems of others, he was weighed down with our weaknesses because he felt the weight of personal tragedy. Just turn over a couple of pages to Matthew 14. Verse 10. And he sent, this is Herod, and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. And when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him out on foot of the cities. So when he heard of the death of John, he departed into a desert place apart. He experienced personal tragedy. Imagine hearing that news of someone so close and so alike in, in mind and thinking, really, as, as John the Baptist, uh, of him being beheaded, the way of his death as well. It, it's a total tragedy. And it affected of our Lord so that he gets into a boat and he goes in to a, a desert place to, to, to get away from the people apart. It affected him and sadness engulfed him. The loss of a loved one in John the Baptist, despite knowing that he would be raised. It had that impact on our Lord. So come back to Isaiah chapter 53. just want to pick up a couple of other things. Isaiah chapter 53. We read through this in verse 5. Verse 7 says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before a shearer is his dumb, so he opens not his mouth. And you'll notice verse 5 and verse 7 that the, the, there's, there's some words that reappear here. These are the physical things. You notice verse 5, he was wounded, tormented. He was bruised. He was chastised. He had stripes on him. See, see all those words? I've circled those because these are the physical sufferings as well, intertwined in all of this. There, there's, there's this physical things where he's wounded, he's bruised, he's chastised, he has stripes and verse 7, he was oppressed, he was harassed, he was afflicted. There's a mounting tirade of words here, isn't there? So we can summarise the third aspect of his sufferings as physical and emotional pain. Think about it. He's in the garden. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the loneliest man who ever lived. No one has ever come close to being like him. His godliness, in a w one way, set him apart from others. And it came really to the extreme on the cross. And when he died, there was no one there except his father. He was lonely. And there was an agony of mind seen in the garden, wasn't there? He was scourged and he was crucified. This was our Lord. And on top of all of that, we won't turn to it, but if you want to just take a note of it, Luke 12 and verse 50 says, the Lord says, and this is early on in his ministry, he says, I have a baptism 
to be baptized with and how am I straightened? How am I distressed? He was. How am I distressed? How am I pained till it be accomplished? This wasn't something you just experienced right at the end, you know, and I'll get through a couple of a couple of days of, you know, a, a few hours of this. This was something he was feeling way back early in his ministry. He was distressed. That's what Christ did in his ministry. But we also need to appreciate that he suffers now. Did you know that? He feels for us now as he sits at the right hand of the Father. There is feeling in heaven, isn't there? There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Turn to Isaiah, just a couple of pages. Isaiah 63, I like this one. Isaiah 63 and verse 9. Here was God's feeling for Israel. In all their affliction... God was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. You notice what it says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Isn't that amazing? In all the affliction of Israel, God was feeling afflicted. And yet he saved them. There was other emotions there too, wasn't there? Love and pity. Think about Hebrews 4 and verse 15. What does it say there? Well, it says he, he was, the Lord Jesus Christ was touched with the, what's it say? What's the word? Yeah. Feeling. The feeling of our infirmities. Chapter 5 and verse 2, he has Compassion on the ignorant. This is as, a high, as, our, as our immortal high priest. He has compassion on the ignorant. Chapter 6 and verse 6. There was those who were falling away. And what were, they going to, what were they doing to the Lord again? They're crucifying him again. And putting him to an open shame, it says. He feels it. He feels shame. He feels like he's been crucified again. As people left him in the days of the Hebrews. Oh, this feeling in heaven from our Lord and from our Father. Well, there's our Lord's sufferings. But what are we going to do with ours? We're told by the Apostle Paul that, and this is in Romans 8, verse 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. Now that's telling us that, that God's looking forward, isn't it? God's looking forward to the end. It's, it's all about our ultimate good. That's what he's saying. It's all about our ultimate good. That's, that's the good. He speaks of here in Romans 8. It's, it's the ultimate good of salvation, eternal life, of being in his presence. And he says, all things work together for good for that ultimate end to those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. I think that sometimes in our lives, believing that is a real challenge, don't you? We might quote these sort of words and other words rather glibly to those who are experiencing problems, but to really believe them, I would suggest, is another thing altogether. Because sometimes the events and circumstances in our lives appear absolutely confusing. They appear unnecessarily complicated. They appear stressful. We're just totally upset by it all. And sometimes the events are such that we can't seem to get our minds around what God is trying to do for us. At times, perhaps we're guilty of believing God could better manage 
the affairs in our life or the life of someone else. We hear of a terrible car accident in our community or a child has been killed and we struggle to understand. And as we go, are we going to say to God, you're being unnecessarily stressful in dealing with us? Are we going to say to God, that's very cruel, surely there's a better way? I'd suggest it can be a real barrier to our faith when we're confronted with such things in our lives and the lives of others. I think the Apostle Paul provides us with a wonderful perspective on why God will put us through the middle of life. We have here in Hebrews 12, these words in verse 5, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And I want you to notice the words that tell us that he understands the emotion and the stress of suffering. Despise not. He knows that we kind of feel we, we don't like this. And we're likely to faint. We're going to struggle. He knows. He's aware of that. In verse 11, he goes on in this chapter. You can have a look at it. He says, I know it's painful. I know it's not joyous, but grievous. That's what he says. So why does he allow it? Well, Hebrews 12 and verse 6 says, For, because, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It's an expression of God's love to us. He sees us. How does he see us? Well, he sees us as children. A child, children in his family. And he looks to our ultimate good. As children in his family, he's wanting the best for us. He wants to save us. He's looking to the end, the ultimate good. He's bringing us close to being his family. How do you feel about that? In the middle of pressure, the stress, are you going to say, well, don't love me so much? So what are we going to do with it? In the middle of our difficulties, which may go on all our life, perhaps we lose a loved one, Someone's sick and it goes on for year after year. Are we going to question God? Are we going to say, well, why do it this way? Why, why did he have to die? Why involve my children, my wife, my husband, my best friend, my brother, my sister? Why take so long? Why so many things in a row? We may never know the answer to any of those questions. But what is important is the way we'll, we deal with the twists and turns of our lives. And I suggest it helps to view our sufferings in a certain way. And I want to just end with three things, three points of how perhaps to view these things. And the first thing is this to consider is in Hebrews 5 and verse 8. It says of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You see, suffering was beneficial to the Lord as well. You know, he was always obedient. So how did he learn obedience by what he suffered? You ever asked that question? I puzzled over that for years. He was always obedient, so how did he learn obedience by the things that he suffered? 
Well, I would suggest that as he faced circumstances, it was through those circumstances that he was able to live out God's character. It's all right to, to, to think you understand righteousness and holiness. Yes, I can understand. I can explain that to you. But here he was. He was tempted in the wilderness. He was opposed by Peter. And he stands up for God's righteousness. He actually has to live it out, is the concept. He knows Judas is going to betray him. He knows the people are going to reject him. Well, it's all right to talk about compassion and long-suffering and say you understand that, but he, the Lord, had to actually live that out as he's, as he's confronted with people who opposed him. And he groans at their unbelief. He weeps over Jerusalem. He lived out compassion and mercy and long-suffering. So I would suggest that we need to see it, that it's not just more trouble, but it's an opportunity to grow by learning to live out our Lord's character. And that can be taken as not just a personal thing as well. It can also be for ecclesial life as well. If you're considering ecclesial matter, it's difficult, it's stressful. We don't like it. But if you see it as an opportunity to grow as you consider again the scriptures, then that turns the whole thing around, doesn't it? I remember when I was first, this is going back a long time, 20, 30 years ago, went to a, an AB meeting and I was told, oh, they always finish early. Well, I happened to walk into, there was some issues. And, and, and I remember there'd been a couple of issues we had to deal with over the first little while and sort of seemed to be fairly close together. And here's another one comes up. And one of our older brethren said, he started the meeting, at the start of the meeting, he said, well, brethren, here's another opportunity to grow. And I thought, here I am all stressed. Oh, are we doing this again? Oh, it's running. It's, oh, no. But it turned it all around. This is another opportunity to, to grow. We can actually try and live out the righteousness and the holiness and the compassion and the mercy of our Lord. It's not just a theory. We're living it out. Hopefully that's a good way to look at the difficulties we face in life. And, and the second thing to consider is this. I want you to come across the Philippians chapter 1 and verse 28. Philippians 1 verse 28 says, And in nothing, he says to the Philippians be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So he says, you're going to be faced with adversaries, but don't be terrified by your adversaries. And the word terrified, it's, it's a, a very strong word, apparently, and it actually means a, a startling or a, a, a flinching, like a, a scared animal. Some align it to, to a frightened horse, terrified by what's in its path. A snake slithers across, and the horse rises up like that. That's the idea of the word terrified. And he says, there's going to be adversaries in the path of the Philippians. Don't be terrified, because opposition signaled, it, to it was a token, that's the word token, it signals two things. What does it signal? Well, it signaled there destruction but your salvation that's telling us God is working God is working in that circumstance why does it signal salvation verse 29 for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake it's Given. Notice that word given. It means to grant as a favour. It's, it's the idea of a gift. A gift was that we might believe and 
suffer for his sake. It's a gracious gift. It's, it's a favour. <laughs> Don't you like that? When I thought about that, it's, it's like a gift. Now, have you all received a gift? You know, you get a gift. Um, Sandra gives me a gift for my birthday. It's all wrapped up in a box, a bow on the top. And she brings it out. Here's your gift. Here's your gift. And this is the picture of, of verse 29, isn't it? It's, it's this gift that's given. And so oh, I'm excited. So I open up the gift. I open the box up. Oh. It's suffering. That's what he's saying. It's a gift. It's given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. That's God showing his favour to us. It's, it's giving us suffering. And it's a token of salvation, notice. He's working in your life and in mine. Now, and that's what our Lord thought. He saw his Father's hand in it all. And, and so Paul says in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, so the joy set before him, and I think the joy there, by the way, is being in the presence of his Father forever. That was the joy, being in the presence of his Father at his right hand, and he endured the cross and he disregarded the shame. We need to strive to see it like that too. And in this way, there, there are two responses we can have to suffering. Some suffer and turn from God. It's like the seed in the stony place in Matthew 13, isn't it? Uh, there's no root sufficient when tribulation and persecution comes because of the word. Well, the other response is some suffer and they turn to God like the prodigal son and, and, and Manasseh and others. And so I think the lesson that we need to learn is don't give in, but endure like Christ. See it as God at work, knowing that he will do right. That's how we need to see it. Hang on. See God's hand. He's in control. He's working on us. For our ultimate profit, for our ultimate good, he's trying to save us. That's what Christ did. He had absolute confidence and trust and belief in his father. He believed his father would raise him from the dead. He was going to be, Christ couldn't do anything. He was going to be dead for three days. He, he couldn't do a thing to influence it. Then he believed that God would be truthful to his word and raise him and he would sit at his right hand. And so our third thing, that I'd like to finish on is that when we're suffering, who do we tend to focus on? Well, largely it's me. But notice what Paul says to do here in Hebrews 12 and verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. He encourages us, us to see Christ, to fellowship his suffering. Think of what he went through for you and all of us, which is really our third point to remember. Don't focus on me, but see it as an insight into Christ's suffering, as a, a sharing with Christ. Look to Christ. And his suffering. Don't focus on me. See Christ in it all. Are you lonely? Then think. I know how Christ felt. They all forsook him. And fled. Are you emotionally drained? And stressed with events bearing down? Then think, I know how Christ felt. He offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying 
and tears. Are you feeling a sense of betrayal? Then think, I know how Christ felt. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his hand against me. Are you physically hurting in some way? Then think, I know how Christ felt. They hit him with a clenched fist. They slapped him. They scourged him. Feeling a sense of embarrassment before your brethren for some reason? Then think, I know how Christ felt. They stripped him naked. They spat on him. They mocked him. Are you feeling for the loss of a loved one? Then think, I know how Christ felt. He went into a desert place apart. In Christ we have a man everywhere spoken against, a man who had no earthly possessions. Whatever we might suffer, only a small, it's only a small indicator of what Christ would have felt. When our Lord comes, he wants to find a relationship exists between him and us. To feel an empathy, a fellow feeling, to feel the closeness that comes from a shared experience. And as we stand and our eyes meet our Lord, perhaps we'll be able to say, I know what you went through for me, Lord.